You're listening to 17 Karat K-Pop. For more information about the variety of topics covered on the show, as well as my other podcast, How to Stand, visit 17karatkpop.weebly.com. And if you enjoy this episode, please consider becoming a monthly donor to support my work and allow it to continue to go on and be free for all to access for as low as 99 cents a month. Visit the Support the Show link on my site's homepage for more information. Hello everybody, and welcome back to 17 Karat K-Pop. This is part 4 in a 7-part series of episodes diving into BTS's literary and cinematic influences on their work. And today we're going to talk about Into the Magic Shop by James R. Doty, which is mostly a memoir but has some fictional components to it, and a really interesting way of looking at the mind-body connection, power of kindness to heal, and all sorts of other messages that go beyond just relating to BTS's work, but also the world. And a, an interesting life philosophy drives his work. So to catch up on the rest of the BT Study Guides episodes, make sure if you're on my show's website to click the down arrow under the episodes link at the top of the page, And then you will find a drop-down menu, go to Best Of, and it should be there. These episodes will also be on the page Sort By Category in the Literature section, and they will be in the Sort By Artist category for BTS. Without further ado, let's talk about the BTS song Magic Shop and Into the Magic Shop, the book that inspired the song, and the author who wrote it, his backstory. He grew up in California in a poor family with a chronically depressed mom and an alcoholic dad. He really struggled at first as he grew up, knowing what to do with and how to handle his feelings of intense anxiety and depression. It really was truly a monumental, life-changing event when, at age 12, he entered a magic shop, and he was just going there to buy something. As is often the case in life, the chance encounter becomes life-changing for you. And that was the case in this magic shop, where he met this woman named Ruth, who basically taught him how to handle those emotions. So essentially what she was doing is making it fun for a young kid to go to therapy when it wasn't really how he viewed it. He viewed it as taking magic lessons, but you could argue she was basically having therapy sessions with him. He is told to think of a mantra that he can repeat to himself. Doesn't matter what it is, it doesn't even have to make sense and be a coherent sentence. Just think of some words that you want to string together and focus on repeating those words. That's one of his first therapy lessons slash magic lessons. So for some reasons that make sense in the story, some reasons that are just totally random, and he doesn't even know why they came to mind, he comes up with Chris and Knob, like a doorknob. So he starts repeating it. Chris Knob, Chris Knob, Chris Knob. And at the end, he's actually calmer, because he realized that forced him to stop and think about what he was saying. It's kind of like when you're counting something or recapping vocab terms, doing a math equation in your head. It takes your attention through both your mind and your mouth, internally and externally. That really can be calming. So that is actually what really helped him calm down because he was just worried about everything, focused on everything at once, but just focus on pronouncing Chris Knob again and again for 15 minutes. And he did, and it truly helped him calm down. And so he uses tips and tricks like that throughout the book his experiences, and how he learned to cope with them thanks to these coping skills this magician taught him. There was actually this one scene in the book where he he spent a lot of time chanting, and then he enters this room where tensions are even higher than usual between his mom and dad. His dad is drunk again, and they have an eviction notice to deal with now. There's just a massive fight. Things are not going well. Tensions are high to say the least. But he just spent some time chanting, and it kind of calmed him, that repetition, that just knowing you're going through the motions of something and your brain power can just focus on a singular task, that calmed him. So by the time he enters the room with this fight, instead of getting wrapped up into the conflict and escalating it, he ends up just going into the room and telling his parents he loves them. Things suddenly do calm down a lot, and his mom just says, we love you too, and his dad just says, everything's going to be okay. And for some reason, he believes him. That is all it takes. When someone tells you everything is going to be okay, sometimes it's not like actually content-wise, substantively, your situation changed. But somehow, even someone just saying that, reassuring you of that, truly can be a calming thing to hear. 
And that's what he realizes is truly the healing power of these magic tricks, aka coping mechanisms, that this magician, aka Ruth, is teaching him. I personally can relate to the story. I've been to things like cognitive behavioral therapy sessions and the like, and I won't go too much into my personal backstory, but I'm just saying it is calming to learn these types of skills, and it truly is life-changing. So this book really dives into that. It dives into the meaning of truly changing your mind can change your world in ways that cannot be stated and stressed enough. I really got hit in the book by a few of the quotes during this first of many magic trick sessions he had, where he basically says he doesn't really remember tons of details about this day, but, quote, the point was... I didn't hear the DJ. He had stopped playing. It just really hit me because that's kind of how I live my life. So many noises going on in my head at once. I've talked about being autistic before on the show, and that is a prime example where all my senses are at 100 all the time, clashing and crashing and all that. And so, so sometimes I kind of visualize that, like if only someone took a TV remote to part of my brain, it's all overwhelming all at once at max volume. Turning down the volume on your mind a little bit is what he's talking about here. He also said, quote, For reasons that I understand now, it was amazingly calming. Repetition, intention, the surest way to change your brain. He started off the book, actually, him as an adult, before he goes into flashback mode, where he is in the middle of conducting a surgery. And he tells this true story about how during the surgery, he truly had a blank out moment. I forget what I'm supposed to do in this moment with this vein. And that's really scary, naturally, because he's in the middle of a surgery on veins and can't remember what to do. But all he had to do in that split second was stop and use a visualization technique he was taught by this quote-unquote magician when he was younger. He just stopped and visualized what he had to do, and that was enough to get him back on track, to take him out of that moment of panic, to get back into the right headspace and remember what to do and go on with the surgery. He's not exaggerating when he says in that chapter that the visualization techniques, that ability to change his mindset that he was taught, truly saved his life and this boy's because if he had messed up that one move, he the boy might have been dead. And so he saved a young patient's life by finding a way to avoid panic. And that is really profound and and really brings home the point of his writing and his life mission, essentially. Jim Doty is the founder and creator of a place called Sea Care, the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research at Stanford. There, he basically leads a team studying care and kindness and compassion and how those things truly have a healing effect on the body. He's all about that mind-body connection, so he uses a textbook basis to better understand more abstract concepts that seem unrelated but really aren't. So ultimately he's studying the neurological bases for things that are, were harder to quantify before. He also teaches neurosurgery. He spent nine years in the U.S. Army Medical Corps. He's on the board of directors for the Dalai Lama Foundation. He became vice chair at the Charter for Compassion International. And he's on the International Advisory Board of the Council for the Parliament of the World's Religions. He's written quite a few summaries of his studies in Huffington Post, and a few of those summaries I wanted to share with you. There are many more, but I do want to share just a few of his writings for HuffPost. He sought to understand how to map out compassion, because he was talking to a student about the concept of crime mapping, which is basically when it's exactly what it sounds like, mapping out where crimes are or where they're predicted to take place, based on a million different factors. But that's the very, very basic gist of it. And so the student brought up the fact it's interesting that we're, we map out things like crime and things like that, but where are the maps to visualize and graphically explain and portray and understand things that are also prevalent maybe more than we think, like compassion? So we spent a long time mulling over the different variables they could use in a study to figure that out. I will link to the full thing on my newsletter. But basically what he did is he ran a test where subjects commit acts of kindness to do what he called pro-social behavior, compassionate behavior, etc. And immediately afterwards, the subjects had to record their response, their feelings, their emotional state. And the resulting 
charts showed. These acts of kindness committed led to a higher match with the study's definitions of flourishing and compassion. So it's a win-win for everyone involved. It's good for you too when you commit an act of kindness. And it also showed a decline in depression, anxiety, and stress. He also considered the element of elevation here, which is basically a concept referring to how we desire following in the footsteps of someone we see doing good. Elevation kind of refers to a ripple effect. So if you see someone picking up litter, for example, you're more inclined to join in and enjoy the benefits of cleaning up the earth if you are not the first to do so. It can be contagious in that sense to just do something nice for someone. And this sense of elevation, this sense that seeing others do good motivated them to do good in their footsteps, follow after them in their footsteps. That showed a correspondence to greater mindfulness and lower levels of depression. Another study that he conducted was on kindness truly aiding physical healing. Quote, kindness holds the power to heal. We now know that this often overlooked, virtually cost-free remedy has a statistically significant impact on our physical health. For example, the positive effect of kindness is even greater than that of taking aspirin to reduce the risk of a heart attack or the influence of smoking on male mortality. Think about that. Kindness can be a stronger medicine than an aspirin. He goes on to say, quote, When patients are treated with kindness, when there is an effort made to get to know them, communicate with them, listen to them, and respond to their needs, and then he goes on to list everything the study showed, which is correlations with faster healing, when patients were treated with kindness, when medical care is given in a way that is kind and patient, patients are more likely to actually respond to it physically. Their bodies will respond to it, sometimes directly, but sometimes less so. It lowers anxiety, which can lower blood pressure and all this other stuff that aids in the healing process. It is associated with shorter hospital stays, and it just makes sure you get diagnosed properly because if you see your doctor as a very patient, easy-to-talk-to person, you're a lot more likely to reveal the truth, to be as transparent as possible, to tell the full, detailed story about medical history or what's up right now that you need help with, whatever the case may be, which leads to a more accurate diagnosis, which will lead to more accurate treatment prescribed to you and a more personalized, detailed regimen for treatment. So overall, the healing process is aided extremely and accelerated extremely by something as free and easy as being kind. And this was also associated with less burnout and more just joy on the job, more of a sense of engagement for the actual physicians too. So it's a win-win again. Doty summarized these findings by saying, quote, at the very least, this research review proves in the context of healthcare and medicine, kindness shouldn't be viewed as a warm and fuzzy afterthought. Something nice to show after the quote-unquote real medicine is administered. Instead, kindness should be viewed as an indispensable part of the healing process. It's the responsibility of those who work and study in the field of medicine to remember the spirit of their pledge and make acts of kindness not so random for the people we serve and heal every day, unquote. This whole thing makes me think about a recent news story where a grandma got a prescription that just said you're allowed to hug your granddaughter now. This was recently when the CDC said it's okay if you have a younger grandkid who is unvaccinated, they can hug their vaccinated grandparent. And she really needed that. And some people may have thought that was super silly and didn't really mean anything. Like, why would they waste their time writing up a prescription for a hug from your grandkid? But truly, that actually has a bigger impact than you think. Getting a permission slip from someone in a position that's trusted and of authority is a truly big deal and probably did make that grandma feel way safer hugging her grandkid and a lot less stressed about it, which then, you know, doesn't hurt physical health. It doesn't aid to your stress, which takes a toll on you physically if you didn't get stressed by something you would have otherwise. That permission slip truly is symbolic of so much more which is what Professor Doty's life work has been about, is seeing an intense correlation between physical and mental well-being. And the power of the mind, the power of therapeutic visualizations, is something BTS taps into as well in their work. 
particularly with the song that was inspired by the book Into the Magic Shop, and the song is called Magic Shop. A few years ago, during a tour stop, Nam June, aka RM from BTS, gave this speech during the concert, basically talking about how BTS sees themselves as this vehicle for healing for others and for not just telling their stories, but opening a door for you to tell yours, opening those communication channels. And he talked about this often cited quote among the fans that really stuck with all of us, I think, saying, if we just reduced your pain as BTS, if our place in your life reduced your pain, brought you joy, and then reduced your suffering from 100% suffering to 99%, or 98, 97, whatever, that's enough. That is huge and important, and that is our purpose in life. That is why we're here, and we take this responsibility head on. And then, in 2018, when the song Magic Shop came out as part of the Love Yourself Tear album, Jungkook answered in a press conference about the song Magic Shop's meaning, referencing that night when Namjoon made those statements about reducing your pain through something as seemingly abstract or indirectly causing your joy as music. And he basically talked about how he wrote the song as a way to open that door. That's why the BTS logo is those open, slightly open doorways. It's letting you into their world. It's a really big symbolic detail for them. The song talks about, and he talked about in the press conference, how whenever you're feeling super, super stressed and overwhelmed, we're going to take on the role of those magicians. We're going to be your Ruth, and they are going to teach us the magic tricks that we need. So he said, go into the mental magic shop you create in your head, and while you're there, we'll be waiting for you. It's like your decompression zone. That struck a chord with a lot of people, I think, and me especially, because as I said on those previous episodes about life as an autistic person with sensory issues and whatnot, I literally do love a sensory room. Like, going away from everyone, taking time to decompress by, and not get so overwhelmed anymore and panic by just finding a way to visualize something, find a way to think about just one thing at a time as opposed to a hundred million things at a time like usual, and just feel like someone's there. Even just hearing or feeling a presence can be enough sometimes, even if it doesn't change your substantial circumstances, just hearing it's gonna be okay or feeling like it is, is huge. And so, basically, they provided me and so many other fans with a mental escape. So it truly has been a coping mechanism for me to do what they said when I'm super overwhelmed. I've done that numerous times now where just take a second when you're really about to lose it. Go in your break room in your head, which to me is a little magic shop. And that they're in there too and we're going to vent in there and open up to each other. It's a very safe space they're creating. And so that's the epitome of why they're so popular as a group because they're making that safe space for people and they are using their platform so responsibly, so mindful of the positive impact they can have, and so willing to engage and make it a two-way street. Not a one-sided relationship, but really making sure we know that we're all in this life together, which may again sound corny, but think about this. There truly is research to back up the mind-body connection, and so if they are healing minds, they're also basically increasing our lifespans here. They are helping get us out of depressed holes, and that cannot be, that impact is just enormous. So the Magic Shop song has a lot of lyrics I could spend time, but I'll just focus on a few of my favorites. I know that you're hesitating because even if you say the truth, in the end it will all return as scars. That is super relatable, fearing opening up because that leaves you vulnerable to someone making fun of you or brushing off how you feel. I'm not going to say anything blatant like find strength. I will let you hear my story. That is really a big lyric here because if you're like me and you're in that weird cutoff age range, so you feel like you're kind of a millennial but a kind of Gen Z, I think we grew up with a lot of messaging in the media about how to cheer up, how to be an optimist, how to look on the bright side of life, hang in there baby kind of mentality. And then I feel like now... Luckily, Gen Z is getting much more of this message of, hey, we're realizing this toxic positivity is not good. That's a real concept, toxic positivity, when you are basically telling someone to suppress how they really feel to put on a happy face, 
and look on the bright side, it could be worse. Those types of comments can actually be a lot more, frankly, harmful than you think. So toxic positivity is being called out a lot more often these days and framed as take a mental health day if you need to, as give yourself more patience, as be gentle, as just be super honest about how you're feeling. If it's a bad day, don't just try to look on the bright side if you want to. It's fine. Just this too shall pass. Just feel how you feel and don't suppress it. And that's what that lyric brings home to me, where they, that's what they're all about, saying, I'm not going to say any platitude like, find strength right now and figure out how to do it. You've got this. But instead, I will say it's okay if you're not feeling like you've got this. They talk about while drinking a glass of hot tea and looking up at the Milky Way, you'll be all right. This here is the magic shop. Open the door and this place will await. It's okay to believe. The magic shop will comfort you. I was impatient and always restless. Comparing myself with others became my daily life. My greed that was my weapon suffocated me. But looking back at it now, I feel like it's not true that I wanted to be the best. I wanted to become your comfort. I wanted to take away your sadness and pain. Lastly, the repeated part of the course I want to emphasize here that really resonates with me is you give me the best of me, so you'll give you the best of you. They're basically making a promise that you are tr promising to just try your best and keep on keeping on as well as you can. You promise to hold on in this world, and I will too. That's our pact. And that's what they've talked about again outside of this song as well with fans. You give me the best of me, so you give you the best of you. So if you're going to show up for me every time, if you're going to be the fans that are so loving and supportive and there for us no matter what, you better be there for yourself too. Hence the name of their whole album series this comes from, which is Love Yourself. There are some key quotes from this book that I'd really like to highlight because not only have they really resonated with me, but they have also, they really have very strong parallels to the content BTS writes about. So here are some Magic Shop quotes and then some BTS-related commentary on them. Quote, Another mystery of the brain is that it will always choose what is familiar over what is unfamiliar. By visualizing my own future success, I will make the success familiar to my brain. Intention is a funny thing, and whatever the brain puts its intention on is what it sees, unquote. Later on, he says, quote, You can turn this little tiny light into a huge fireball with only one thing, your mind, unquote. All you need to do is change your perspective and work on changing your mindset, and your whole worldview changes, and then your whole life and quality and sense of life can change. These next quotes have a more clear BTS connection. Quote, There are a lot of things in life we can't control. It's hard, especially when you're a child, like you can change anything. But you can control your body and you can control your mind. That might not sound like a lot, but it's very powerful. It can change everything. Unquote. Then, quote, Each of us chooses what is acceptable in our lives. As kids, we don't get a lot of choice. We are born into families and situations. And it's all really out of our control. But as we get older, we choose. Consciously or unconsciously, we decide how we are going to allow ourselves to be treated. What will you accept? What won't you accept? You're going to have to choose, and you're going to have to stand up for yourself. No one else can do it for you. Unquote. Those quotes to me are the epitome of what BTS is always saying in their songs and elsewhere to us. From day one with the school era trilogy, wanting to have control as a kid, as you're growing up, because you can't help where you're growing up, how you're growing up. You can't even to some extent control your values and thoughts because when you're young and your world is just your parents' house, you just are socialized in a certain way and you don't see alternative ways to think and view the world to the same extent as you do when you get older and you expand your horizons. Remember in Damien, the BT Study Guide Episode 1, which I intentionally did first because I think it has a lot of themes and messages in it that resonate with the whole rest of this BT Study Guide series of episodes, is how they talk about, you know, Damien was living between two worlds. My parents' house made up one realm, and then the other realm was unfamiliar to me in almost every way. And that quote refers to when the BTS music video characters tried to move on from their parents' way of viewing and seeing the world, and figuring out what they agree and disagree with, and challenging 
preconceived notions and just stepping out of old trains of thought and stepping into the world that is new and nerve-wracking to step into but is needed to truly figure out who you are outside of your parents' world, outside of anyone else's world. As an individual, who are you? What do you believe in? What are you passionate about? What should drive your individual decisions? So it's interesting because he says each of us is choosing what is acceptable in our lives. What do we tolerate? Consciously or not, we tell others how to treat us by what we show that we value. And you got to show up for yourself to show to the world what you value and therefore how they should treat you. And showing up for yourself is what the Love Yourself trilogy is all about. So the first category of key quotes here, I think, is about that reminder that the power of the mind cannot be underestimated. It should not be underestimated, and it often is. Second category of key quotes here was that thought about struggling to find control over who you are, and then once you have that control, it's scary and unfamiliar, but then it's so rewarding and exciting. This final category of key quotes here is about the reciprocal nature of certain thoughts and feelings. You put good into the world and you get good back to you. The book says, quote, if we want to be happy, we make others happy. If we want love, we have to give love. If we want joy, we need to make others joyful. If we want forgiveness, we have to forgive. If we want peace, we have to create it in the world around us. He also says, quote, we get sick alone and get well together. And again, with BTS Hassan, you give me the best of me, you help me be my best self. So now you better give you the best of you. And whether you like it or not, you will. It's reciprocal. It has that ripple effect. Last quote from this book that I really want to spend time talking about. Sometimes it's not that you're not important. It's just that you're not seen because the pain of those around you makes you invisible, unquote. Think about that. It's just that you're not seen because the pain of those around you makes you invisible to them. So you wonder why are you suffering and no one's looking? Why are people looking the other way? It's not something to take personally. It's because everyone has those battles. Everyone is struggling. And sometimes those cloud and prevent us from seeing the fact that other people we walk past every day are personally dealing with a lot of inner demons as well. And we just don't see that. We all probably ironically feel inv invisible and lonely together because we can't open up to each other. The technical definition of compassion includes three components. There's noticing that people are suffering, there's feeling empathy for those people, and then there's taking action to help those people. So compassion involves noticing, feeling, and then taking action. And that's what BTS is putting into practice. They notice and acknowledge and validate feelings, then they feel empathy for you, and then they take action to try to heal by saying, why don't we try escaping into this mental magic shop with a cup of hot tea and everything will be okay. And that's what they encourage ARMY to do, because ARMY notices injustices, feels empathy, and then takes action. That's why so many charity donations are doubled by the army after BTS makes them, or the army reaches out to each other in a ripple effect kind of way. One story led to another coming out, and it makes me think of when BTS set up that big phone booth looking place where fans for a period of time got to send their fan letters through Weavers into this machine that printed out your note. So you could just open up about whatever you wanted to open up about, tell them your story. And then all the papers were printed out and it was just a phone booth type of thing full of scrolls of paper of everyone around the world who had submitted stuff. It was just a bursting collection of people opening up. And it was such a cool visual representation of what being an army is all about, where you see your story literally there represented in that with you. And BTS is there to pick up your story and read it and resonate with it. One last thing I want to address today is just that some people may argue that I'm being contradictory when I say not giving us platitudes, they are taking mental illness seriously, and also there's this big emphasis on just changing how you think about the world. And I understand that can be a bit, for me as well, annoying when, annoying to say the least, when people say just change how you feel, just look on the bright side. Changing your mindset is all that's needed to change your world. That's a really sometimes really triggering thing to say to someone with depression or some other mental illness where it's not that simple and it feels very annoying when people are like, 
all you need to do for a better life is and a better mood is to look on the bright side or whatever. And so you may wonder, well, isn't that what you're saying here is what this book is all about is using that mentality of just change your mind. And so I want to call that out and just point out that it's not that black and white here. There are so many nuances and complexities in every individual's mental health journeys. And so I don't want to use any blanket statement saying that this approach to looking at treatment is for everyone, but I think it's very worthwhile and could be a very globally positive approach. Working in tandem with other things. Changing your mindset does not equate to suppressing feelings necessarily. It just doesn't, if you really think about it. Telling someone to just move on can be harmful and help them move on. There is a way to do that. And sometimes it's hard to find the language to explain those differences and how those things can coexist, which is why on the past three episodes of BT Study Guides, I have talked about the limitations of language to really understand the human experience because so much of it, there just aren't words to express. And in Dr. Doty's case, it's hard sometimes to even visualize and quantify the human experience. How do you map compassion? So all to say that this book and the Sawn Magic Shop and all of BTS's work really is a big accumulation of knowledge and support for a way of looking at the world as redeemable, as a place that we can make better for everyone. If we start positive ripple effects, if we stop dismissing the importance of a mind-body connection, if we just listen to each other, and in turn, if we feel like we are showing up for ourselves every day and then allowing our needs to be met, which helps other people's needs be met, and then there's a more kind, patient world all around. It's a cycle, and it comes all from a place of compassion, which is what the song is about. It is what that Nam June quote about dropping your pain 1% is enough. It is about what Dodie was talking about Ruth doing in his life. It all comes back to compassion, which is a three-step process. It's not just feeling or doing, it's both. That's why it's important to recognize that changing your mindset component here cannot just be discounted as offensive. There's so much more nuance to it than that, and it is needed as step one. Notice suffering, feel the empathy, then take action. Those are the three parts of compassion, and if we all tried to remember that, I think this world could be a much better place, and I'm very hopeful that it could be, because we have this moment in culture shifting these mental health conversations so that they're less stigmatized, but more nuanced and more complex, and not just saying, screw toxic positivity, that's over, or the opposite. We're finding ways to live in the gray area and figure out what we can control. That's what the book is all about, finding a way to do that. That's my interpretation of the significance of Magic Shop and Into the Magic Shop by James R. Doty, which I will include links to on my weekly newsletter. Thank you for listening to my take on the story. Feel free to share your own views on this book and stay tuned for the next piece of literature we're going to talk about, which I will keep a surprise, but it's coming up on the next BT Study Guides episode. Lots more themes to discuss on the show next week, so stay tuned for that. Thank you all for listening, and I will talk to you all very soon.